Ready and three, two, one. Last week, my brother Tim texted me. Caviar got bought by DoorDash, he wrote, and I may be looking at a significant pay cut by the end of August. Caviar is the food delivery service that Tim has been peddling for in the streets of Philadelphia for much of the last three years. There are no stable, living wage jobs, he continued in his text, and I can't even apply for unemployment because Caviar won't give me their contact information. I have 100K in student loan debt that accumulates interest daily. I've accepted it and am fine, but this economy and society with it. Are teetering on the brink of full collapse. Meanwhile, my 20-year-old car is sitting in Northwest Philly outside an auto shop that's closed due to COVID, processing a second insurance claim in which a car that was involved in a shooting outside our house rear-ended me in a hit and run. Don't know if the guy who was shot lived, but don't worry. Our man-child president is making America great again by sending his stormtroopers into cities to crush the anarchists. Who are obviously the ones who are really responsible for these horrendous living conditions in the world's wealthiest country? Or maybe I'm the one who is responsible. Maybe I should become a better entrepreneur of the self and use the pittance in my bank account to buy Instagram likes to boost my branding. Disgusting. End rant. Tim's story is not unique. In fact. It is not unlike either my own or my other brother's story. All three of us have been working since our mid to early teens, and between us, have virtually every entry-level job on the market covered. You name it: Dairy Queen, McDonald's, the local grocery store, factory manufacturing, pizza delivery, retail, social work, special education, construction, freelance tutoring. Landscaping, housekeeping, odd jobs on Craigslist, snow removal, custodial work, chaplain intern, or academic entrepreneur. And what do we have to show for these years and years of precarious, often backbreaking labor? Like many of our listeners today, my brothers and I are all of us just one more crisis, one more medical bill, one more credit default, one more missed month's rent. Away from being completely and utterly screwed, we all know how it feels. We're all living in this Biff Tannen Back to the Future hellscape, where everyone, or most everyone, is in one way or another either screwed now or very likely to be screwed in the very near future. Whether through job loss, dried up unemployment, lack of insurance, the loss of a loved one, the threat of eviction, or the threat of species extinction, death. In a word, has never in my lifetime appeared more the undisputed champion over life than it does today. But there are different ways in which we might greet this death. Some of which may be more up to the challenge than others. As today's guest puts it in the Book of Dead Philosophers, a philosophical death has a sobering power, as opposed to the unphilosophical evasion of death. That compels us to run headlong into numbing intoxication, and/or the often soul-murdering obsession with "quote-unquote" making it in life, as if by making it, death can somehow be cheated of its ultimacy. Indeed, as we read in the book of dead philosophers, to philosophize is to learn how to die. It is to learn to have death in your mouth, in the words you speak, the food you eat, and the drink that you imbibe. It is in this way that we might begin to confront the terror of annihilation, for it is finally the fear of death that enslaves us and leads us towards either temporary oblivion or the longing for immortality. As Montaigne writes, "He who has learned how to die has unlearned how to be a slave." And if to philosophize is to learn how to die, then to unlearn how to be a slave. Is to philosophize. (laughs) 
This is Philosophy for the People. I'm your host, Nathan Wiley, here with producer Jessica Cook. Hello. Today we confront the ultimate uncompromising truth of life, namely that it is haunted from beginning to end by death. And here to discuss this uncompromising truth is well-known public philosopher and acclaimed author of some 20 books, the Hans Jonas Professor of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research, Simon Critchley. Simon, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. And hello, Nathan. Hello, Jessica. And thank you, Tim, for those, those thoughts. Well, Simon, let me just begin by saying that I think what Tim's text expresses is something a lot of people out there are feeling these days, which is simply that we do not want to be slaves any longer, shackled by debt, threatened with evictions, and leaving our fates in the hands of a rapacious ruling elite. And so, if as Montaigne taught, and you pick up on this as a central theme in your Book of Dead Philosophers, to learn how to die is to unlearn how to be a slave, then well, I guess we need to learn how to die. And if, as Cicero taught, to philosophize is to learn how to die, then we must learn how to philosophize. But as you make clear in the book, to philosophize this way is no easy undertaking, since it requires nothing less than the willingness to face down the terror of annihilation, which is what ultimately enslaves us and leads us into either escape or evasion. Well, this sounds a bit grim, doesn't it? Um, but I suppose we begin with the idea that you know, philosophy, as I understand it, is a, an art of dying. And that's a very, you know, it's a very classical idea. I mean, it depends how you tell the story, and the story can be told in many different ways. But the story that I tell in the book of Dead Philosophers, I could tell different versions of that story. You know, we begin with a, Socrates, who is um, put to death by the city of, of Athens and insists to his followers, his disciples, that they should cultivate the art of dying that is, that is philosophy. I mean, there's a lot of caveats in that. I mean, he's also arguing in that, uh, in the Phaedo, the last dialogue for the immortality of the soul. So, I mean, I guess what I mean is that philosophy, as I understand it, one, one, one version of it is to get us to face up to the, the fact of our finitude and to, um, to face that down and that we, um, we find that a singularly difficult thing to do because we tend to live in a counterfeit eternity, a counterfeit immortality. Um, we go on one day to the next and... And then we invent various ideas of how existence might be continued beyond death with the various forms of religion, which also enslave us. And so philosophy on that model would be a way of freeing ourselves from that and getting us to face up to the fact of our, of our finitude. And that would be the condition for something like liberation. Yes, Cicero notes, and you pick up on this again in your Book of Dead Philosophers, mm -hmm. that it was axiomatic for most of ancient philosophy that the philosopher was someone who looked death in the face and had the strength to say that it is nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, there seem to be several especially conspicuous faces of death that are staring us down today. Mm -hmm. There's COVID-19, there's racism and police violence. There's Trump's authoritarian state violence, threat of nuclear war, climate catastrophe, homelessness, hunger, and of course, let's not forget the soul-murdering corporate grind that expels everything and everyone from which it has extracted mm -hmm. maximum use value. Quite a lot, right? Quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. What a list. <laughs> wow, yeah. Yeah, so it's the list of reasons not to get up in the morning, but... When we do get up in the morning and we're faced with this multifaceted multiplicity of death's faces, what exactly is the philosopher facing down then when they face down death and say that it is nothing, given the plurality of death's faces? Is it really anything outside of ourselves? Um, it needn't be. It could just be. It could just be a you know a, a personal matter. It, you know, it's a question that'd be a separate set of questions, whether that 
the understanding of philosophy has any relationship to um, you know wider forms of liberation in relationship to some of the other things that you mentioned: climate crisis, racism, corporate capitalism. I mean the um, I mean you know this podcast is called philosophy for the people and the idea of philosophy for the people is a you know it, it's a you know you could then imagine that philosophy is an enterprise that is and has been since its inception democratic but it's not <laughs> I mean, and uh, at least of all in someone like Plato who was arguing for a he was you know Philosophy in Plato takes shape against democracy, uh, against theatre, against forms of imitation, but mainly against democracy. And in the wake of the failure of Athenian democracy, yeah, the uh, the Athenian democracy that put his teacher to death. So, I mean, the thing is, we don't know, we don't know what what Plato meant by anything really, and we don't know if he even wrote these dialogues. They might have been written collectively. They might have been authored in different ways in the academy. We know very little about the the composition of the dialogues and we know even less about their intent. So and people that claim to know, you know, what Plato thought are um, you know engaged in different kinds of wishful thinking. But if you take something like the Republic as a, as a text, then Socrates says that democracy is the most uh, is the most is the most brightly colored and multifaceted form of political life and it seems really attractive and that's why it's terrible that's why it inevitably will slide towards authoritarianism and, um, and tyranny which is uh, the end point of democracy for um, for, for Socrates at least in the arguments of the Republic so philosophy, in a sense, we have to kind of. It's important to remember this that the you know if we if we think of the Republic as a central dialogue by Plato, um, which it doubtless is, then it was um, staged um, outside the city, which would have been the democratic city in during a period of long and drawn out war against another power, namely Sparta, the Peloponnesian Wars that lumbered on for 30 years and eventually led to the capitulation, defeat of Athens by Spartan. And um, it was in a, the house of a, a, a merchant at the port of Athens, the Piraeus, where the Republic took place. And um, the Republic begins with a discussion of money making and because Cephalus, who owns the house, is a, is a merchant. And it also begins with a question of whether uh, an old chap like Cephalus can still derive pleasure from life and pleasure from sex. And then we kind of slowly lurch into a discussion of justice, and which then covers the, the ten books of the Republic. But the whole thing takes place in a, in a private house, and its audience is an audience of um, ten men who were, or 12 men, some of that, who were listed as being there, met, most of whom are silent. And at the end of it, in a sense, nothing really changes. So the, um, we like the idea of there being a direct relationship between philosophy and forms of political liberation. On certain views, there are. But uh, if we go back into antiquity, then um, that question is kind of moot. And uh, you know, Plato seems to be recommending a, a form of society that would have been egalitarian, but not democratic, and where the people that governed were trained in philosophy and could administer power justly. But that came together with a very clear, you know, class demarcation, hierarchy, and a, a separate range of, you know, d division of labor into military, artisanal, intellectual, and so on and so forth. And it's not, you know, into our, to our eyes, that's not a very kind of palatable picture. So uh, it's, important to, it's important to remember that, you know, when you're um, looking at these questions, where that takes us to another question. So, so philosophy could be 
to philosophize to learn how to die, that could be simply a question of personal liberation in a world that is uh, doomed. And um, that might be it. Um, you know, the soul of a soulless world or something like that. We could, or we could link philosophy to wider social and political movements, but that would be a, a separate set of questions. I didn't want to, I don't want to put a downer on things, but there's a, you know, philosophy is a, it, it's nice to think of democracy as democratic, but it's actually not. The first philosopher that I'm aware of that really comes out in favor of democracy is, is John Dewey, you know, uh, in the early 20th century. Before that, it's fairly, you know, what's fairly common is a rejection of democracy and a kind of terror of uh, the rule by the masses and the people that that would have um, led to. So we have to keep that in mind. Well, there's certainly, I would say, a democratic energy in much of what you write, and you write in a, a style that's very accessible. Sure. In fact, I introduced you as a public philosopher because you have a public presence and speak to people like my brother, uh, Tim, and myself as well. Yeah. Although I'm now in the academy, uh, I've been practicing philosophy outside mm -hmm. of the academy for well over a decade, probably for around 15 years now. I think of it in terms of audience, I think of it more in terms of, um, you know, the, what, having, a, having a sense of uh, an audience, wanting an audience, and being able to kind of attune your voice to, um, to, to questions of audience and, and philosophers for, you know, the last century in particular, but maybe the last two centuries, but particularly since the rise of professional philosophy, the audience has been largely other, other philosophers and philosophers have been seemingly quite happy with that. And um, I mean, I'm not happy with the idea of being a philosopher. I mean, I don't think of myself as a philosopher. I happen to teach philosophy, but um, I think of myself, you know, as someone that with a kind of bundle of, you know, strange <laughs> eccentric interests that, and I could have been in, you know, different, uh, department or not in academia at all. I didn't start off in academia. And then public, yeah, I think that's kind of the idea of being a public philosopher. It sounds good. I don't, it, it, I don't feel it describes what I'm trying to do. I'm much more sensitive to ideas of, of audience and that audience for me has never really been um, an audience within the academic world. It's an, a question of finding an audience outside and trying to listen to what that audience is, you know, how, how it responds to things that you're saying and trying to find lines of thought which uh, echo and resonate with that audience, that I'm very interested in. And I try and write clearly. I think everything can be said clearly. Uh, so I don't believe in, I think there's often a, um, a muddle between clarity and, and depth. I think you can say things that are, that are deep, but they can always be said clearly. But often, People that think, I think, superficially, can be can do that in incredibly obscure ways. So um, I think clarity and depth go together. So I think you know thinkers that I learned a lot from, like Wittgenstein, back in the day, is a difficult thinker but a clear thinker. Yes, clarity and depth and humor. Oh, humor! Yeah. And the book of dead philosophers is full of laughs. Mm -hmm. You noted our grim start. So to bring a little humor into the mix, <laughs> right. one commentator remarks of your book that you write with dash, humor, and an eye for scandalous detail. Absolutely. Another that the book is full of wonderful absurdities and is extremely enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Cool. Uh, but I have a question about the role of humor in the Book of Dead Philosophers. On the one hand, you state in the introduction that it is only in grief that we become most truly ourselves, a form of death that structures existence. Uh -huh. So why then the juxtaposition of death with humor right. and dirty in the Book of Dead Philosophers? What's the connection between death, grief, and humor that you're bringing to light mm -hmm. for us here? Well, um, that's a good question. I mean, in relation to humor, I mean, I've been, you know, I mean, I. I'm very interested in humor. I wrote a book on humor. I kind of collect jokes and I'm a, I'm a student of, you know, 
all sorts of stand-up comedians and different things. And I could, I could bore you for hours with that stuff, but really it's the, you know, it's the spice of life, the soul of life. It's what makes everything kind of tingle and blur together for me. I mean, you know, it's not, not jokes, but humor. Humor is a kind of, um, humor is a form of sociability is, you know, really, really, really important for me. And one thing that's determined, not determined, one, because I don't, I don't make really choices about the work that I do. I find myself, you know, going down certain avenues and then, and then you've, you found out you've got to a, a certain place and there you are working on a topic. And um, uh, so I've often been, uh, I found that I've been working on things which I've got a passionate connection to. So I did a book on, on David Bowie because I'm a David Bowie fan. And I think that, you know, something like pop music in the hands of Bowie is something which can produce the most extraordinary uh, ranges of, of resonance and depth and can open up uh, a world and open up a whole range of emotion in a way which is um, uh, profound and, uh, and commonly accessible, right? In little, you know, three minute lumps of music. And also, you know, I did, I did a book on, on soccer, it was called here, on football. And, you know, so for me, it's, it's very important that the, uh, the insights that I have, such as, such as I have, uh, you know, mediated through I mean, passions that I have, things that I'm passionately concerned about. And those passions, I hope, uh, you know, can be expressed in ways which are, uh, are clear and which, and, and they're also, they're commonly held, they're widely held passions. I mean, for many people, music, you know, remains a way in which the world first opens up. So, how can we think about that? That becomes something. So, so that's so, so. So, humor is one of those topics, and and also what I like about writing on things like humor and music and and uh, and football slash soccer is that you don't need a philosopher to explain these things to you. So, I like the kind of um, self-refuting character of some of the topics that I work on. That you, you know, the last thing you need is, is a philosopher to explain humor. Everybody. Most people, some people don't, but most people understand humor. They understand how jokes work perfectly well. You can offer kinds of forms of illumination and clarification, um, but um, this is a way of refusing to be an expert. Death and grief. I mean, as I recall, I mean, Book of Death Philosophers was written a long time ago in the kind of in the deathly context of Los Angeles. I was. Um, I was in Los Angeles for a year in 2006, 2007, and um, I didn't much like it. And so I had access to a great library, <clears throat> and I just um, began to amass manuscripts and thoughts really quickly and began to put together this kind of absurd kind of counter history of philosophy through deaths, this kind of catalogue of 190 deaths done in a series of kind of short frames, some of them one line, some five, six pages. But um, so there's that. The form of the book interests me. It's a kind of it's a kind of absurd counter history of philosophy, deliberately absurd counter history of philosophy. And death and grief. Um, I mean, that's um, would take us into some other areas because uh, I don't think philosophy is very good on grief. On the whole, philosophy is rather bad. At grief. I mean, again, Socrates. One of the things that he's he complains about in the Republic is about tragedy. Is there's too much lamentation because there's too much mourning and grief going on. So, I'm a, I'm a grief person. And then, I mean, so what I'm thinking about in relationship to that is really interest in um, uh, the religious tradition, mainly Christianity, which is very good on grief. Yes, yes. As Cornell West is fond of saying, Jesus never laughs, but Socrates never cries. Yeah, yeah. Jesus never laughs, but then again, the first miracle is to transform, tr transfer, you know, water into wine. And, you know, the first miracle, which is before, um, it's clear that 
that Mary, so Mary, <laughs> Jesus and his mother go to a wedding in Canaan. <clears throat> and it's not clear that she really knows who, what kind of tricks her son can do. And, um, but there's something clearly special about this young man. <laughs> and he, um, uh, they run out of wine and the, um, the, the, you know, the, the, let's say the, the person in charge of the wedding says to Jesus, says to Mary, you know, can your son do something about the wine? And he, he puts it to Jesus and Jesus says, woman, my time has not yet come. Woman, my time has not yet come. And then he trans, tra they transform the water into wine. It's hard not to think of that as a joke. And um, and then you can think about the the whole question of the folly of uh, the folly of Christianity, the folly of the cross in in Corinthians, which is picked up by Erasmus in Praise of Folly, and so on and so forth. So at the centre of Christianity is grief over a, a dying man slash slash God slash God slash God. So there's that issue. So grief. Uh, so and then um, you know I, I'm. Uh, yeah, and I'm kind of I, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a closet, not so much closet Freudian. I mean, Freud is very important for me, and so um, Freud's uh, "Morning and Melancholia" is, is a you know, remains a kind of fundamental text. That the, the, there's something about grief which um, displays the you know the the, por the porosity and vulnerability of the self. And the way in which the self is defined by its relations of uh, creaturely dependence on others that we feel in the agony of grief, which is you know a terrible thing on the one hand, but it also shows that we we can't do any of this alone. We are dependent, rational animals, as Arthur McIntyre used to say. So grief um, is very important. Well, yes, you write to this point in the Book of Dead Philosophers that it is only in relation to the acceptance of self-loss that there might be a self to gain. This yeah. is crucial in my view, you continue, mm -hmm. for it also means accepting what we might call our creatureliness. Human existence yeah. is limited. It is shaped by evolutionary forces beyond our control, and it is my wager that if we can begin to accept our limitedness, then we might be able to give up certain of the fantasies of infantile omnipotence, worldly wealth, and puffed-up power that culminate in both aggressive personal conflicts and bloody yeah. wars. What a way with words, eh? And but the idea, but I begin. I mean, really, I mean, going back before the Book of Death philosophers, and also, you know, what's happened since that. I mean, I really begin from the idea of um, human limitedness. Um, and uh, that philosophy uh, begins, does not end in disappointment, but begins in disappointment. It begins, um, and it has to circle around the acceptance of, uh, of limitation. This is crucial. And I think, you know, horrible as COVID is, um, what is, uh, how would you put that, kind of salutary about uh, the virus is that it reminds us of our limitedness. It reminds us of the uh, the limits of our, of our knowledge, the limits of um, of what it means to be a self. A self is something that can be wiped away by a you know uh, uh, an airborne transmissible virus, and that's who we are. And that picture <clears throat> of the human being. As, as a vulnerable, fragile, um, you know, wretched and bored and lonely, right? All the all the problems in the world come from our inability to sit quietly in a room. Pascal, that that idea I think is really important that we 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 keep um, running into fantasies of omnipotence, fan fantasies of. Uh, Having an overview, and there are different versions of that fantasy. AI would be kind of where that one place where that fantasy has been running in the last few years. That hasn't really helped really much, has it, in the last the last year? Where has all that technological wonder been in the face of this humble, humble little virus? You know. So 
I think philosophers talk a lot of clap trap about AI and stuff like that. So it's uh, so yeah. So the, so that idea, the idea of limitedness of being a creature, uh, I think is it, it's a good place to start. It's much better than an idea of uh, the individual or an idea of an ego or or something like that. And there seems to be a strong connection between this fundamental recognition of our limitations and humor. Yeah. Because humor functions in large part in relation to limits. Absolutely. So a good comedian is perhaps more keenly aware of limitations than the average person and knows when and how to push those limitations or cross boundaries. In other words, comedians mm -hmm. know how to have fun with finitude. And it's precisely this ability that perhaps makes comedians such uniquely free individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, free in their captivity, free in their their weird kind of um, vulnerability, and uh, you know, and of course, the great traditions of humour are often bound up with the um, the threat of annihilation in different ways. I mean, the great traditions of say, you know, Jewish humour. Um, this is obviously a way of coping with the fact that people have been trying to, you know, kill Jews for at least since 1095, you know. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Well, humor becomes a way of sort of mastering the fact that you can't master things, of accepting your limitation and, of course, also upending a whole set of... Um, you know, what's expected of you. Um, so humor is a powerful, powerful thing. Indeed it is. And I love that you said earlier that humor is a form of sociability. Yeah. Since that suggests that bringing humor into philosophy, as you do, is also a way of making philosophy more sociable. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. More human. Uh, to the people, I've got a sense of humor, the people that want to, you know, find themselves ridiculous. Uh, that's because it, it means the, the essence, the, the core of humor, the core of humor is, um, is laughing at yourself, is finding yourself ridiculous. This is another insight that Freud has, which is brilliant. I mean, Freud writes um, uh, a book on jokes in 1905 that nobody reads. But the one thing they know about the book on jokes is that it's not funny, which it is. It's full of great jokes. Could Freud's, Freud collect? Yeah. And um, jokes are related to the unconscious. They're forms of unconscious aggression, repressed content, and all of that. He doesn't go back to the topic until 1927. So 22 years later or so, tiny little paper on humor, just called De Humor. And he says, um, and he begins with an example, which is always what Freud does well. He begins with a, a small empirical example. And he talks about uh, a condemned a man that's been condemned to death, and on the morning of his execution, he goes out into the courtyard, he looks at the gallows, looks at the sky, and says, well, the week's beginning nicely. Right? And then Freud says, why is this funny? This man is going to die. And he looks at the sky and asks himself that question. So what humor consists in for Freud is the capacity for self-ridicule. And um, so it's a kind of sociability based upon the fact that we're, uh, what we all have in common is that we're ridiculous. And it's that ridiculousness which um, uh, perhaps brings, brings us together. And of course, it's psychopaths who don't really have, and paranoid people that don't really have a sense of humor. This is why you know, Trump doesn't, Trump is a, an obvious example of that a profoundly humorous, humorless man, right? And that's what's really worrying. And if we fall into that humorlessness and there's a risk of that, um, then uh, we are in bad shape. So it's a sociability, you know, the humor, this, this goes back to the humor, but it could be a separate question, but humor is census communist, humor as a sociability, but a sociability, which is, which is the ability to pull common sense and sociability apart. So what a great comedian does is to draw on a set of socially available uh, norms, practices, uh, 
uh, mores and to reveal them and to upend them at the same time. And that's, um, and we laugh at that point, but it's not the laughter that's important. Laughter is never what's important because laughter is easy. Anybody can tell a joke, make people laugh. It's what you do when you've made people laugh. When you've opened them up, then you hit them with something deeper. And that's what great comics like, you know, Richard Pryor um, can do. You use the laugh as a kind of opening device to kind of push into the recesses of their soul. Yes, this is often where my practice of philosophy ends up. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to throw the books out the window and throw on Weird Al Yankovic and have yourself a dance party or, or what I call an alpha. Right. There was a really good Weird Al Yankovic uh, article. Was it in The Atlantic about six months ago? Was it in The New York Times magazine? It was a brilliant piece on, you know, trying to explain the Weird Al Yankovic phenomenon. And uh, yeah, true. Yeah. So that's good. That shows that you're a, it shows that you're not a, a psychopath. <laughs> so that, 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 that's excellent news. And um, it's also, I mean, I don't, I mean, I think to, to maybe this is where I differ a little bit. Oh, I don't know. How would I put this? Um, people make assumptions about me that aren't true. So I, you know, I left school at 16. I did weird stuff for years. I was a, I was a punk, you know, in the 77, 78 in, you know, around, around London. I worked in factories. I did all sorts of terrible jobs. I had a whole series of accidents. Life was an absolute mess. And then I went, somehow I, I managed to get to what in American terms would be a community college when I was 20, I began to read and study and then got to university college when I was 22. But, and I took it, you know, I really absorbed things fast. I was only a student for six years, all told. Um, so I was really going quickly and I absorbed a lot of stuff. But I never really took it seriously, like the academic structure universities and I still don't so um, I find the American talk of schools and programs and disciplines and rigor and all of that just laughable I thought that for me there was a complete continuity between um, you know the world that had opened up to me through listening to you know obscure German music in you know when I was 14 and reading you know um, reading Sartre and then reading Hegel and then reading tons of other stuff. It, for me, it was just different. It was just, it was working in a, diff, in a different medium, but with the same intent. And then, um, you know, happily enough, I got, I got paid to think and got a job in, in a university. But I mean, I, like many people, I still have the, the imposter syndrome, you know, the feeling that, you know, I don't really belong here and someone's going to say at a certain point simon look the game is up they found out about you know, it's time to go home <laughs> yes yes well so, several years ago I, re I recall i saw a filmed lecture you gave at the european graduate school and sure. during this lecture you paused mid-sentence just in the middle of making a point you looked up from your notes and said something like i just know they're coming to take me back to the factory any moment now yeah, right. I feel that. I do feel that. It's it's a, a bit. So it's great that it's it's I've been able to, you know, you know, defy that for so long. But I still, in in a sense, I still don't really take it seriously, and consequently, I don't really, I don't really give the best advice to, uh, you know, say graduate students who want to go on to do philosophy because I still don't really know what's what the whole thing is. Um, and I, yeah, but what I would say is that I think it's it's question. There's a question of uh, an absence of um, fear. I think there's something about yeah, there's something about inhibition and fear, which I think is dreadful. And I think what I like in, I mean, some of the students that I work with over the years, and some of the people I've met, is I'm always looking for a kind of courageousness um, in them. And um, it's hard to keep that courageousness alive in academia because it's it's uh, not a system which uh, encourages that. It encourages conformity and, um, you know, uh, internalizing a series of 
protocols and norms, which in a sense are about inhibiting yourself and questioning yourself. And I think it's important to remember that, I think it's important to try and just, just to try and be as fearless as possible in, in thinking. Well, when you become fearless, then you might start crossing boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. You might start saying things that make people uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm now, I'm now channeling Dave Chappelle, right? So he says, was it two, I think it's Dave Chappelle, two things, you know, be nice and don't be scared. And that's kind of it. I mean, that's a good way of being a philosopher. Be nice and don't be scared. Most philosophers don't get past the first one. Be nice. I mean, a lot of the philosophers I've met over the years have been not the nicest people I, I could imagine in the world. And there's no reason for that. And, uh, and then you should be, what you should be doing, what, you know, now I'm, you know, 60 years old and I, so I've been, in, you know, around these blocks for a while is, is trying to, this is where I would come back to philosophy for the people. This is, you know, trying to encourage people to do, or well, to be nice to each other and to do work which is, uh, which is fearless in relationship to what they are actually thinking about, actually motivated by. And, to, and if that is the, the weirdest, most eccentric, obscure thing, then to do that and to pursue that with, um, with complete conviction. Well, I take encouragement from what you just said, because that's precisely in part what I'm trying to do with this podcast, Yes, to do philosophy based on what most motivates me, what most interests me, and to do so with conviction. And it does require, for sure, a certain level of fearlessness. I know, for example, of someone who proposed a project that was critical of academic philosophy. This person took their proposal to a trusted professor for feedback and was told in no uncertain terms that they should do something to themselves that, for the sake of politeness, I won't repeat. All right, okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I accept, I accept, I mean, I, I rejoice in, um, you know, reading a text and, and, and a kind of rigor and a clarity and things which academia can, can provide, but that has to be put to the service of something, something uh, more broadly accessible in, in my view. And um, there's often a sense in which philosophy, um, particularly in the US, for reasons which are puzzling when you begin to think about it, because this is a country with a tradition of public thinkers, you know, Emerson, Thoreau, Du Bois, and a whole bunch of others, but somehow uh, a sense of academic propriety is dominated. Not you end up that philosophy often just seems to be the, um, the decision to say, well, this is philosophy and this is not. This is what counts as philosophy and that doesn't. Over there is nonsense and rubbish and in here in our rigorous little cell of professionally um, controlled activity where we can cultivate a kind of form of apprenticeship and a kind of a guild system, which is really what philosophy is in, in North America. Yeah, and I, I, I just I, I, I refuse that, and I, I mean I've had I've had a lot of um, a lot of backlash and pushback over the years as well, um, but that can be you know distracting and uh, to say the least. But you've got to um, got to ignore it. Yes, you've got to ignore it. Press on and stay true to your convictions. Uh, I wanted to bring up something that you emphasize in the Book of Dead Philosophers. And that's that there's never been a more important time to distinguish between philosophy and sophistry, since yeah. we're surrounded by countless new sophistry. So I wonder, what are some of the sophistries that we should look out for today, and how is philosophy to be distinguished from them? I wonder if maybe their respective attitudes towards death might have something to do with well, it. Well, yeah, I mean, the sophistries would be, you know, anything that is... Um... Uh, making a claim to immortality um, or not looking death in the face and saying, you know, not saying that someone has died, but someone has passed the way people do here. Passed where? Where have they passed to? Or they're, you know, with the angels now and all that stuff. I just think it's just, I, I think, I don't see why we should tolerate that kind of, uh, that kind of talk. It's, um, if, if the point that we we're making earlier is true, that what makes us human is our 
um, is our relationship to death, then that's what has to be internalized and uh, made sense of and, and celebrated and not evaded through forms of um, magical thinking, much of which is religious, although there are forms of religion which are very good at dealing with finitude. So, yeah, so, so, um, and the sophistry, I mean, I've got a different set of views on sophistry, which um, I won't bore you with now. I wrote this book on tragedy, which is the last book I wrote, which I spent years and years writing, which is in many ways my kind of attack on, this is my attack on philosophy. And I come out there in favor of the sophist and in favor of tragedy against philosophy. It's, it's a, a more kind of Nietzschean kind of book in many ways, although Nietzsche isn't really mentioned. Um, Nietzsche is very hard to write about, which is why I don't write about him. What do you think about the idea that myths and sophistries and magical thinking tend to proliferate when an empire is in decline? Maybe, maybe. I mean, I think, I think, I think plague and the, the plague and the end of empire is is a theme. You know, if you, I've been reading, um, one thing I've been reading um, is Procopius. Uh, Procopius, who was a historian in in, um, in Byzantium in the seventh uh, century. Who write, is the official historian of, of that period of the Emperor Justinian and Theodora, and then writes this extraordinary thing called the Secret History, where he, he spills the beans on um, the Emperor and Empress and shows what complete tyrannical um, demons these people are. And um, also, what's Procopius is you see the description of empire in a time of plague and. Um, Plague is something which, it's a means of transition from one, in, one imperial structure to another. So maybe COVID will have that effect here. Well, to the point of COVID and tragedy and present day circumstances and transition, well, we're living through tragic circumstances now. So we, yeah. like the Greeks, inhabit a war-torn world in which we are caught up in what you note following Anne Carson. Mm -hmm is a destructive cycle of grief, rage, and war. However, you believe that yeah. tragic circumstances like those we're living through today might also allow us to break this vicious cycle, that they might provide the condition of possibility for ethicality, and that crucially, the experience of losing one's mm. identity that is characteristic of tragic experiences may in fact be what ultimately allows for us to relate to one another in more profound and satisfying ways. Mm -hmm. So many of us today are understandably full of grief and rage. You could hear both in my brother's text message, which I read uh, cool. at the open of this podcast, but we don't want to perpetuate violence and injustice. So can tragedy help us to move from a destructive rage to a more constructive, and here comes Freud, sublimation of that rage that might allow us to break these cycles of grief, rage, and war, and open new futures? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, I hope so. That's my, that, that would be my profound wish. The first thing that has to be uh, understood in relation to tragedy is that if a situation is tragic when we realize our responsibility for it, our implication in it, there's an overwhelming, overwhelming uh, way in which we think about tragedy as something that befalls us from outside, and therefore we can, we can squeal with rage or outrage at something that happens. We have to understand to understand things tragically is to understand our implication in that in that process and our responsibility for it. So there is something properly uh, tragic about, say. Um, the question of race in the United States, uh, in the sense in which it's a question of the implication of people in that uh, systemic process. That would be the, the first thing that has to be accepted. And also that one cannot uh, look out. So another thing about tragedy is you can't look outside of the situation from some God's eye point of view and, um, and point out errors. You are we are 
within a densely woven uh, fabric of history. And so what, what tragedy requires, in my view, is, is, a, is, a deep, uh, is a deep historical understanding, which would complicate, obviously, certain you know, sort of right-wing narratives, but it would also complicate certain left-wing narratives. It would complicate the way in which uh, some people think of themselves as, as Marxists see the world, um, and there's a tendency to, um, which has been, you know, enabled and, you know, inflamed with social media in the last 10 years to uh, always attribute um, the object of anger as something outside, as something it is directed at, and it's an internal object, not an external object. That would be the, that would be the first thing, the first move in any tragic understanding. And then if we were... If we were mature and adult enough, then we could begin to kind of figure that through, figure that out, and um, and then come to some uh, come to some uh, hopefully different set of ethical considerations. And that's the kind of work I was doing in um, you know uh, the uh, on, you know the, the go back to Tim's tattoo with infinitely demanding that infinitely demanding book was my kind of attempt to do a to write a, a theory of ethics insofar as I could do that, uh, which is also a critique of the way in which morality is normally understood and uh, and, and a defense of a, of a vulnerable, dependent, um, open um, ethical self, which can be related to a different set of political strategies and understandings. I mean, that would be that, that, so, so things do connect up in that sense for me, although I do tend to keep them in separate boxes in some of the books. I have to ask about this notion of tragedy and circumspection and recognizing our individual implication in tragedy as a condition of being transformed by it. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this notion differ from what some philosophers claim? I'm thinking of Slavoj Žižek and Maurizio Lazzarato in particular, mm -hmm. when they say that the predominant ideology today is one that allows the neoliberal power block to continue to externalize its failures onto individuals who, according to this ideology, are styled as and effectively forced to become so-called entrepreneurs of the self. Yeah. You point the finger at the system, there are three fingers pointing back. Don't fix the system, fix yourself. Come work for Uber, make your own hours, are some of the mantras from this ideology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, strangely, I would then have to agree with Slavoj on that, although we've had our differences over the years. Um, you know, there's a tendency in the, particularly in North America for... Um, for systemic failures and systemic problems to become issues of personal personal responsibility and personal failures, so that when someone loses their job, or you know the the message you read out from uh, from Tim at the beginning, then that becomes something where people blame themselves for that, and that's also not understanding things tragically. Sure, one is part of that, but no, there are there are wider systemic questions here which. Um, which have to be understood. This isn't, uh, and, and the idea of self-entrepreneurship or, you know, self-styling or um, the aesthetics of the self is something which I think is, I mean, there's a there's a lovely kind of a, um, ancestry to that line of thought in the, the Stoics, although actually I hate the Stoics, but, um, but that then, and then through the way Foucault picked that up and that ends up becoming a kind of, ideology of self-enhancement and self-betterment, which I find deeply nauseating. Um, I mean, the self is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. We're beginning to run low on time, but I wanted to ask you before we say goodbye about your book on David Bowie. Oh, right. That was a great book to do because it was, um, I mean, firstly, well, the books I write are often not books. That began as just kind of messing around with Bowie, you know, years and years ago, then it turned into an essay, then it became a book. And then it was published in about 13 or 14. And then, and then Bowie died. And then I did a different, um, wrote some new chapters for it in the, for a UK, the UK publication. And then, 
And the, the, the wonderful thing about that was just meeting Bowie fans. And I met, uh, particularly after he died, I met so many Bowie fans in different circumstances. And, you know, and that's, yeah, that's one of the greatest experiences that, you know, I'm a Bowie fan of a certain generation, but I met Bowie fans who are 10 years old, 25 years old, 35 years old, you know, and it, and he means um, the same to them as he does to me. And then you realize that actually whatever is going on in the music of someone like Bowie is communicable. It's inheritable. This will go on and this will be interpreted and this will open people's worlds in the future. And that's, that's great. There's a tendency, you know, if you, what I mean is there's a tendency to, um, to say, you know, with the LCD sound system, you know, I was there, I was there in, you know, I was there in 1972 when he appeared on Top of the Pops. I was there, I was a Bowie fan back then. In a sense, that doesn't matter. That's like saying I was there in 1914 when Kafka read out that manuscript. It doesn't matter. Um, Kafka isn't reducible to the original set of his readers and influence. And similarly, with these are things which become transformed, communicable, and inheritable. And that's um, that's important to me. Uh, yeah, and what? Yeah, I mean, with Bowie, a lot of things are forgotten. I mean, there's a lot of you know. It's interesting the way in which the history of popular culture gets told, um, and Bowie becomes this towering figure and lots of people are, are left out of that story who should be included but the fact that he's in there at all is is marvelous and um it's not that he's a philosopher i mean he didn't need but the, the bowie was able to bowie was able to give voice to that feeling of self-distancing that feeling of um not not being at one with the world or at one with oneself um that is you know, really is where 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 philosophy often begins for people that you you find yourself um, in a world where you don't fit and then you start to think about it, read about it, and puzzle it out. And Bowie gives voice to that in a powerful way. Yes, it certainly does seem that that's where most people or a lot of people who take an interest in philosophy find themselves at one point or another in some form of state of alienation well then why don't they so that's the thing this is where you know so i'm still i mean i'm a you know i'm a um and i've really come out in the last year or so strongly with this that i i'm an i'm an existential phenomenologist right so that i i'm an an old existentialist i think existentialism provided the the way in which things open up provided the rich levels of description and um, and then you know conceptual structures in relation to that and phenomenology gives us a, a a method of of describing what shows itself what comes into prominence and that's uh, that's that's the way in which people move into philosophy for all the right reasons and then that becomes very hard to sustain within the discipline as it's called I think that's a great pity because uh, that's why we lose sight of audience and the public and the people, I think. Well, we're certainly doing our best not to lose sight of the people in this podcast. But Simon, as an existential phenomenologist, and I think here is maybe a, a perfect place to conclude, you give a very thought-provoking existential phenomenological definition of love as openness to receive what is not in your power. Yeah. So if to philosophize is to learn how to die, and facing down death involves overcoming our fear and accepting annihilation, the ultimate event over which we have no control, no power, mm -hmm. then does it follow that ultimately the aim of the philosopher is a kind of love? For me, yeah. The, the, the aim of the philosopher is a kind of love. So if, if um, I mean, so death is one side of it. There's that acceptance of limitation, dependency, vulnerability, that you can be wiped out by a virus or whatever it might be, but that has to be the precondition for the opening that is the opening of the, uh, that would be the movement of love, which would be, you know, to give what you do not have and to receive that over which you have no power, right? To give what you do not have. Uh, love is not, cannot be control. Love is a kind of commitment. Um, 
but you don't, as it were, have it, you can just continue to kind of embody it and display it. Um, and you receive that over which you have no power. That's a kind of, um, if you're lucky, a kind of a, a kind of a grace you can get through the, the movement of love. So to that extent, this is this is very old fashioned stuff, but you know, love would be stronger than death. Love would be the counter movement to, to death. And again, you know, the philosophers that are able to articulate that are, are few, I think. Um, Heidegger is not amongst them. And, um, and often it's, in within, it's within religious or spiritual traditions that you find that thought best articulated, which is kind of be a separate discussion. That's why, that's why I'm so interested, say, in, in mystical traditions and things like that, because it's about an acceptance of finitude that is a precondition for an opening uh, to love, which then becomes love of God. And that's fundamentally a philosophical attitude, isn't it? Love, wonder, or openness, and acceptance are all part and parcel of the philosophical attitude classically understood. Yeah, yeah, well, that's fair enough. Um, you know, and it would be, um, I mean, my, I mean, it, philosophy was just, it's where I ended up. I began as a, you know, a literature student, you know, with these interests in, you know, sort of pop music, or whatever, but I began as a literature student and philosophy was just where I found the best teachers at the time. And it enabled me to, it was, it was a permissive environment. It allowed me to do things, but it could have been elsewhere. And uh, it could easily have been in a, uh, a divinity school or a religion department. Yeah. Why not? Well, you certainly fit the secular atheist description, but you write books with titles like Faith of the Faithless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not a believer. I mean, in, in the, you know, in the, the way that's usually understood, but I'm certainly not a skeptic. I mean, I, uh, someone that I've come to appreciate more and more as the years have gone by, largely because of ignorance on my part, is the um, is William James and William James. I find um, you know kind of exemplary of you know, this is this is kind of what a philosopher might be, someone who's just open to this range of experiences. So the varieties of the varieties of religious experience is a fascinating book because. Um, James has got, you know, his brilliant, you know, philosophical mind, but he's never skeptical. He doesn't find these things ridiculous. He understands that these are the ways in which uh, the human beings concerned make sense of the world in the most powerful way. So this has to be understood. Um, so I, I kind of begin from that set of assumptions. I don't think we're just crazy. Yeah, I think I think you can't. I mean, to do. To do philosophy without religion is puzzling, right? So we, and that's a kind of anachronism that we begin from some post-Kantian idea of philosophy as, I don't know, secular or even atheistic, and then we back project that onto the history of philosophy. Whereas the history of philosophy until what the 18th century was, you know, was overwhelmingly theistic. So to separate philosophy from Theology doesn't really make much sense if you're interested in the history of thought. So you can't just dismiss those people as stupid or gullible or crazy. That makes no sense at all. 